BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. This episode of Black Box Online Radio is brought to you by Rep Sports and Ray's Energy. Are you a fan of energy drinks, protein shakes, and health foods? Well, I sure am. I use the stuff almost every single day. They sell Ray's Energy products at my local gym, but you can have them shipped to your home. Use the coupon code NED075, that's N-E-D-075, for discounts applied at the checkout. The link is in the description box. All right, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. Just a couple of quick announcements before we begin. First, I hope everybody had a good weekend and everybody is doing well. Last Friday, on the Anything Goes segment, I did an episode about the Root 8 Killer, and a big thank you to everyone who checked out last week's um, episode, because in the true crime world, there are some very bizarre moments. Yes, the Zodiac Killer mystery is very bizarre and perplexing on its own, but with the Root 8 Killer... It's the story of more or less a serial killer legend who is operating in Connecticut. The long story short is that there were a, a series of homicides that took place starting in the 1980s and going all the way into the new millennium. And is it the activity of a single serial killer? Or are these unconnected murders and people were just using a particular area as a dumping ground? And something that furthers that theory is that some guy murdered his girlfriend and ended up confessing to it, but he said that he dumped her body in a particular location because he wanted to pass it off as this unidentified serial killer because he had heard the stories of how bodies had been dumped in that particular area. And if you'd like to hear more about it, you can check out the episode on this channel, Who Was the Route 8 Killer, Connecticut's Darkest Mystery. And there are now more than 1,000 episodes of Black Box Online Radio, and in the true crime world, I've definitely talked about this type of subject before because I also have an episode on the Miami Strangler, and in that one, I was reading part of a book that had been written by Michael P. Burns called The Flat Tire Murders, talking about the crimes of South Florida, and there's a serial killer legend in Florida that is very, very similar, beginning in a couple decades before the Route 8 killer, where there are the, there were a series of homicides that took place in Miami, and was it a single serial killer? Was it a group of serial killers? Or were these unconnected murders that just happened to be somewhat similar? So I would invite you to check out that episode as well if you're curious about any of these true crime cases. And there are now several episodes about the Long Island serial killer on this channel, and that one also has some of the exact same theories. In it's not just like a wild, far-out, fringe, radical theory. Some people genuinely believe that that's the answer to the Long Island serial killer mystery, that there are unconnected murders, and multiple people were just using a part of Gilgo Beach on Long Island as a dumping ground, and um, that could contain the answers to everything. So if you'd like to follow along with all of these true crime discussions, I invite you to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And a great way to support all of these efforts is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that 
in the description box. You can make a contribution to support the show. All contributions will be spent on things like equipment or buying true crime books so I can talk to you guys about these cases, anything Zodiac-related, serial killer-related, or just any aspect of the true crime world, any subject under the sun or in the darkness, and all contributors will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. But I would like to begin with some of the, well, requests that you guys had to weigh in on a particular discussion that's been happening in the world of Zodiac Killer research. There appears to be a very strong disagreement between two people, and that is Tom Void of ZodiacKiller.com and Drew Beeson, author of Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer, as well as the host of the Zodcast available here on YouTube. To provide a little bit of context and clarity, Tom Voigt released a video on his YouTube channel called Zodiac Killer Quickie No. 2, Don Chaney. Don Chaney is, of course, a former friend of Arthur Lee Allen. I mean, both of them have passed away now. Arthur Lee Allen passed away in 1992, and Don Chaney passed away in 2009. They were um, both heavily, heavily mentioned throughout the world of the Zodiac Killer, more or less. Robert Graysmith even relied heavily on Don Chaney as a source he's mentioned all the time in his writings. In Zodiac Unmasked, there are just countless references to Don Chaney telling these stories of Arthur Lee Allen. Don Chaney was also featured in the documentaries, saying some things that really made people feel rather uneasy, or he was off-putting, or he was a very suspicious character. And one person who caught on to that was Drew Beeson, who began to look at the possibility of Don Chaney being the Zodiac Killer. He then went on to write a book called Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer, and launched a, a segment on YouTube called The Zodcast. And Tom Voigt was a, a very, very strong opposition to that, saying that uh, Drew Beeson was selling a for-profit book that had numerous errors in it, as well as not having the strongest understanding of the Zodiac material. And not only that, Tom Voigt is also upset, he was and is upset, with the fact that Don Chaney was supposedly eliminated by law enforcement back in the early 2000s. But what on earth actually happened? And, I mean, let's look at some of the... Yes, and actually, I'm going to do something that's perhaps not the most practical thing in the world, and that is to read comments from someone else's YouTube channels, from both Tom and Drew's YouTube channels. Is that a good way to spend your life? No, but am I going to do it anyway? Absolutely, yes. And the first um, comment that I would like to go to provide a little bit of clarity and it is from Midnight Ventures, who says, Ned at Black Box entertains the Don Chaney theory. Never once have I suspected him to be the Zodiac. I still think it's someone we are not yet aware of, most likely. And Tom Voigt responded with some questions, and this is why I wanted to uh, read this comment by saying, What is this Chaney theory exactly? It seems to change on a daily basis. Was Chaney the Zodiac? Or was he framing Alan? Or were Cheney and Allen a team? And what exactly does Paul Avery have to do with it? Or Sandy Panzarella? It's not a coherent theory as much as a brain exercise for mouth breathers. All right, well, I'll try to answer some of these questions. I mean, I totally don't have to, but I will try anyway. Number one, what is the Cheney theory exactly? Was Cheney the Zodiac? Um, the short answer to that one is yes. I started talking to Drew Beeson about this in the early parts of 2020, after going through his material, and when I interviewed him, he said that he was about 90% sure that Don Chaney was the Zodiac, and 99% sure that he was the Lake Berryessa Stabber. Of course, the Zodiac was a serial killer who operated in California in the 1960s, and um, some people even think into the 1970s. I personally don't agree with that, but committing um, four confirmed crimes, and the third one was the Lake Berryessa Stabbing, the only time the Zodiac committed a murder by knife officially, but some other crimes may have taken place by knife, most notably the murder of Sherry Jo Bates in 1966. But yes, that Don Chaney was 90% the Zodiac, and then 99% the Lake Berryessa Stabber. And there's a very big section in Drew Beeson's book, Sighting In on the Zodiac Killer, when he talks about Don Chaney's relationship to Arthur Lee Allen. And when I first talked to Drew about this, I thought he was standing by something called the perfect patsy theory that this guy, named Donald Lee Chaney, 
was very intelligent, but he was an underachiever. He was somebody who was well-educated. He was a mechanical engineer, but he was also a very crude and um, rough-spoken guy, and he didn't have the best habits in the world, and not the best family life either. He seemed to have some type of falling out um, with his kids and wife at times, but also Don Cheney was someone who had an extremely intelligent mind, but didn't always benefit from it. And he figured out a way to become a serial killer and blame it on somebody else if he ever was suspected of it. In short, a way to commit some type of criminal masterpiece, but not get caught. And that was the Zodiac Killer mystery. Why? Because he knew Arthur Lee Allen, who was a sex offender, child molester, someone whom the general public and the police and everybody in the world would have despised because of his actions toward children. Don Cheney could have committed the murders, and Allen would come under suspicion but never get truly caught because, once again, the forensic evidence wouldn't support it. Now, is the question, was he framing Allen? I think that um, I answered that one there. He wants to make it look like Allen could have been a suspect but never actually get caught. And Drew Beeson has talked about this rather extensively. Why did the, um, why didn't uh, John Cheney want Allen to get convicted? Number one, then he, Allen would get credit for this criminal masterpiece that he has created, the Zodiac Killer Crimes. And by so, I'm not trying to make light of the murders at all, but that's the way that the killer would have thought about it. As well as the attention would, would be over. Now, I think almost all parties agree that Don Cheney seems to like being interviewed and discussing the case, talking about Arthur Lee Allen. He liked having the spotlight on him. He liked being featured in documentaries. He liked talking to Robert Graysmith or whatever he did or whoever wanted to pay him any amount of attention at all. And if Allen were actually convicted, most of that would go away. I mean, he could have framed Allen so easily if he had actually been the quote-unquote Zodiac. I mean, then he could have planted a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt on Allen's property, or how about one of the firearms? Or um, if he is, if he wasn't even the Zodiac, but he wanted to make Alan look guilty, he could have made some type of weird phone call from Alan's residence if he had so much access to him. But um, he wanted Alan to become under suspicion, but not get um, convicted for the crimes. Now, were Cheney and Alan a team? This one, I think, is referring to something. A little bit more recent. I said when I talked to Drew in 2020 that he was standing by that perfect Patsy theory, but in recent months I think that he has altered his um, Zodiac theory a little bit and is beginning to think more that Alan and Cheney were working together to a certain degree, and I'm not completely sure the role that Arthur Lee Allen would have had in Drew's theory, other than Allen had some type of limited activity, that Don Cheney was the central planner, the more or less mastermind behind the whole thing, and Allen played some type of minor role in the Zodiac crimes. And what exactly does Paul Avery have to do with it? Well, Paul Avery and Don Cheney went to college together at Bakersfield Junior College, and um, Paul Avery was the director of student assemblies, and um, I'm just going off of memory here, but I think Don Cheney was actually the president of the Automobile Association, but don't quote me on that one. But yes, Paul Avery is a very prominent member of Bakersfield Junior College. He is very involved with... Um, not I don't want to say student government because I want I don't want to miss um misstate a fact but he's the director of student assemblies he's very well known on campus and Bakersfield Junior College is a very small campus so when the Zodiac is is writing these letters to Paul Avery or something saying your secret pal such as the Halloween card card rather than a letter he could just be trying to get the attention of Paul Avery for some unknown reason or the simple fact that. Don Cheney knew who he was, and he had this type of um, connection from his past to Paul Avery. Yeah, I went to college with that guy, so I'm writing him some type of weird, confusing letter because I'm a serial killer jerk. So that's my attempt to answer these types of questions. And of course, uh, Drew Beeson can always uh, correct me if I misstated anything in his theory, but I think what Tom Voigt was referring to is that, that um, Drew has had somewhat of a 
a reversal on the fact that Alan was the perfect patsy. Now he's more viewing him as an active participant. Now the statement from Midnight Ventures, Ned at Black Box entertains the Don Cheney theory. Entertain? Sure. Endorse? No. Because I'm not endorsing anybody's Zodiac Killer theory until I feel 99.9% .9 sure that, okay, yes, absolutely, this is the, um, this is what happened. But as far as the way that I think about the case, I do give a lot of credit to Drew Beeson for creating the narrative on how one person could have been involved with the Zodiac crimes, or even two if you're going to view the active participant. Back in 2019, I was reading more and more about the Zodiac case. I had even been putting out Zodiac episodes on Black Box Online Radio for about two years, not as regularly as I do now, just every once in a while. And I really just began to formulate my own theory. And I looked at all of these differences in the crimes. The Zodiac murders David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. The Zodiac murders Darlene Farron. And that's just sneaking up on people in the dark and firing some gunshots and running away. Then the Zodiac puts on a hooded costume with the Zodiac symbol, brings pre-cut lengths of rope and a knife to Lake Berryessa, and stabs the victims. And I was just thinking, that is so unbelievably bizarre because I am running a true crime channel and I'm talking about true crime cases almost every day and that is a very bizarre deviation and pivot and alteration for a serial killer and then two weeks later the Zodiac murders Paul Stein which also doesn't fit any type of pattern based theory what on earth could possibly be happening and I began to think that the answer was just multiple killers, and I was looking at how the crimes could have possibly been designed, and based on the handwriting, I was thinking that, okay, there's one central planning mind. There's one person who is either calling all the shots, or if there is a group, then there's a leader, and then four different people committed these crimes. And I didn't know the term for it at the time, but I was thinking about a thrill-kill club, but I called it the group murder theory, thinking that there were at least four or five participants. I mean, the central planning mind could have also been one of the murderers. So, I mean, either four or five people were involved with the crimes of the Zodiac Killer. And I went back and forth between a lot of these different theories. But one thing that I never, never gave up was... One person could have done this. I mean, it's possible to commit crimes in a different way. Who on earth says that criminals have to follow some type of rule book? In fact, it's quite to the contrary. Everything that they do is illegal. They don't follow the rules. But as time went by through the year of 2019 and into 2020, I was just leaning more and more toward that multiple killers thing. And I was about to just endorse that type of theory and be like, okay, my name is Ned from Black Box Online Radio. Not that my stance on the issue is that valuable, but I was going to be like, this is what I think happened. This was this t some type of either Thrill Kill Club or multiple killers operation. And then I discovered Drew Beeson's uh, YouTube channel because you guys in the comments section were requesting that I respond to his videos on YouTube. And ultimately, I read his book later on in that year. But... I just found that a very clear narrative on how one person could have done everything, even if he now says that there's some involvement from Arthur Lee Allen, all right, but it was just such a clear narrative on how all the pieces of the puzzle came together. And um, again, that doesn't necessarily even have to be about Don Cheney, but just about how a single perpetrator could have been behind the Zodiac killer mystery. When the Zodiac says this, it could be tied to this type of meaning. When the Zodiac is spelling a word this way, it could have been tied to this aspect of a person's life. And it made it seem so much simpler. So I'm really glad that I didn't endorse that type of uh, group murder theory that I had been thinking about, because I was just... I would have done it prematurely. And I think a lot of people, especially the people who post on discussion boards and in some of the uh, Facebook groups, they think of a theory the way that I did. Hmm, okay, this is what makes sense to me. But then, instead of facing contradictory evidence, they just start uh, getting tunnel vision or cherry-picking to get a desired result or just not 
willing to admit that their observations might be completely wrong, or there might be alternative possibilities, and then they think of these wild, wild things. They'd be like, okay, no, this was all orchestrated by the Japanese Yakuza tied to the Mafia because of this reason and that reason, and they'll just say anything you could possibly imagine until the cows come home. So... That is, that's why I haven't endorsed anyone's particular theory yet, because it's an unsolved case and we are still learning about the information. But um, some people have actually made the request that I would write a book, a Zodiac Killer book, about that kind of research process and that journey that I was um, it, just telling you about, about the observations that I made in 2017, 18, 19, and 2020, and just tell the story in book format. And at the all this time, though, I've said I've never wanted to um, write a Zodiac book, but then I, this year I thought, you know what, why don't I try? And I wrote out five pages of um, an attempted Zodiac book, and then I decided, you know, this really isn't turning out the way I imagined. It's not really me. I'll just talk to you guys about it. Maybe I'll do a longer episode sometime this summer about just that, the uh, research process behind all of my Zodiac observations. But again, that wouldn't be a book just coming out in YouTube video format. And the next comment comes to us from Daniel Bauer, who says, Yeah, Arthur the Zodiac was like, Hey, buddy, Don, lick a few stamps, will ya? LOL. And Tom Boyd responded to that comment by saying, Neither had DNA that matched the Zodiac evidence. And what I believe Tom Boyd is referring to is that Tom Boyd met with Don Chaney in the early 2000s, I believe it's actually in the year 2000, and he interviewed him and conducted a rather lengthy interview talking all about Arthur Lee Allen and his Zodiac experiences. And Tom and Don Chaney began exchanging numerous correspondences, or at the very least, Tom has said that Don Chaney sent him multiple pieces of writing, and Tom Voigt thought that Don Chaney's writing was so similar to that of the Zodiac Killer that he even alerted the authorities and Don Chaney's handwriting, fingerprints, and DNA were taken, but they all came back as negative. So that's why he believes that Don Chaney should not be a Zodiac killer suspect. And he also says that famously about Arthur Lee Allen, but that one, I believe, was determined in 2002. Neither had DNA that matched the Zodiac evidence. Daniel Bauer responds by saying, You really believe that? Well, maybe, but... Arthur, I feel, was way more intelligent than the police knew and were um, and that we were aware of. I think he was aware that DNA was going to become a thing in the future. Now, I don't know too much about that, but um, I noticed that there's a comment here, a follow-up from Robin Irwin, that says, I'm curious, do they have the killer's DNA? And then Tom Voigt responded to Robin Irwin, saying, That is still a work in progress. As of my last DNA update of late last year, and this is one that I genuinely don't understand, because on this exact same comment thread, Tom Voigt is saying that neither had DNA that matched the Zodiac evidence, and then someone says, well, wait a second, do they have the DNA in the first place? Work in progress. And I genuinely don't know what to make of that based on how little information, I mean, do they have the killer's DNA or not? I mean, the only possible way I could reconcile all of that and say... Okay, well, there's some type of partial match, but um, it's not 100% conclusive. And recently, I've become very good friends with a guy named Mike Rodelli, author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and The Hunt for Zodiac. I was talking about his book last week on the Zodiac Killer News Report. And I've been talking to Mike Rodelli a lot, and Mike Rodelli believes that neither Cheney nor Allen or the Zodiac, but rather a Norwegian-American named Shel Cavale was the killer, a very wealthy man who was working in the auto import business, in fact, the largest importer of, um, was it, Volkswagens on the West Coast, as well as heavily involved with British motor cars, but he did love the Italian ones as well, and Mike Rodelli may not have convinced me that Shel Cavale was the Zodiac, but what I think is perhaps more convincing from his research is that they do not have the Zodiac's DNA. Do I know that 100%? No. But do I believe that? Yes. Because if they have extracted DNA 
from an envelope that the Zodiac used to mail letters, then it came from the outside of the envelope. I mean, so says everything that has been shared, at least that I've encountered. And if that is the case, the possibility for contamination is overwhelming. I mean, how would you know that only the killer touched that part of the envelope or touched the top of the stamp or touched the outside of the stamp? I mean, we're talking about something go going through the Postal Service. So, that's where I stand on the DNA. Unless Tom Voigt knows something that I don't, and yes, he knows a lot more than I do about this, but unless there's some type of info that he's not ready to share yet. And I also noticed that there is another comment when someone points out that Tom Voigt says something in his video that he has multiple letters from Don Cheney, and this is from Captain J who says, you have more Don Cheney letters? Could you please post them? And then Tom Voigt says, Looking at other YouTube channels and subreddits, it's clear to me that most people aren't even up to speed with what is already out there. And um, I'd, I'd also be curious why Tom Voigt wouldn't want to share those. Maybe he simply doesn't want Drew Bezison to uh, see them. But I would hope that if we're actually dealing with some type of investigation, or if Tom Voigt's theory is correct and Cheney is not the Zodiac, well, why not? Why not share them? I mean, that would actually support his um, stance on the subject. And I mean, I, T Tom Foy doesn't have to listen to me. He can do whatever he wants, but I don't see any reason not to share them either uh, in, on YouTube in a video or even on his website, ZodiacKiller.com. But uh, thank you to everybody who weighed in on that. And one more time, that was available on Tom Voigt's channel, the episode was called Zodiac Killer Quickie Number 2, Don Cheney. Now, Drew Beeson responded to this because that video was mostly directed at him, and he's pointing at a very particular epi epi comment that was left on the episode that said that Don Cheney and Paul Avery attended college together was learned back in 2000 with classmates.com offered one week free trial. If someone tries to pretend it's a recent discovery, you know they're either a fraud or a moran, M-O-E-R-A-N. And uh, yes, that was meant to be some type of um, intentional misspelling for comedic effect. I don't dispute any of that there. But um, that really goes against the Bakersfield connection that Drew Beeson discovered. Once again, talking about how Drew Beeson found out that Paul Avery and Don Cheney were classmates at Bakersfield Junior College, and as I understand it, Drew Beeson has actually copyrighted that discovery, but Tom Voigt even disputes that, saying that Drew was not the first person to discover that. Somebody did when they were using classmates.com in a one-week free trial. Now, in Drew's video, he says very clearly that that is um, impossible because Don Cheney was never mentioned in any yearbook he he learned he found out that Don Cheney was a student at Bakersfield Junior College because of a newspaper, and then he found out that Paul Avery was listed as a student, and it was indeed the same Paul Avery. Again, Drew can correct me if I get any of this wrong, but I think the um, immediate immediate response is that um, somebody who is not Tom Voigt found this info on the one-week free trial using classmates.com that Paul Avery and Don Cheney were classmates. I don't know who that is, and that is also something that Tom Voigt hasn't shared yet. So, I mean, again, he doesn't have to do anything I say, but we're all eagerly awaiting to find out the full truth behind that story, and I don't see any reason to hold back. Again, if you um, have anything that would actually help your case, then why not? And I should mention that Drew Beeson has written out something, which is even for this episode here on Black Box Online Radio, and it says, Here is a challenge question for Tom Voigt. If Don Cheney's DNA should rule him out, supposedly, as well as fingerprints, and even his handwriting was not a match, and should be ruled out as a suspect, shouldn't Arthur Lee Allen be ruled out too, and removed from the front of his website? That will never happen, as Allen is good for his business. When he felt he had to dump Allen as a suspect due to the no-DNA match, he picked up Geik to keep interest in the case overall. This is just how he makes a living. He also just made up the nonsense about a new DNA find that couldn't have come from the Zodiac. He makes stuff up to keep people interested. He is a grifter. 
so some definitely heated tempers on both sides. But, I mean, that, there is something that I think all of us need to be aware of. What actually happened with Don Cheney's DNA if, if Don Cheney provided handwriting, fingerprint, and DNA samples, then what really was the end result? Because there are a number of possibilities that could happen. Number one, they could be positive. Number two, they could come back as negative. And the third could be somewhere in the middle, like there could they could be inconclusive, or there can be some type of interference if the um, fingerprints are not preserved well, that there can be like smudging together, it just and there can be faults on the parts of technicians. We experience this in the true crime world all the time. Think about what I said with the postal workers and contaminants and how it could be somebody else's DNA on the envelope. I mean, these things genuinely happen all the time. And um, I'm really not sure the entire full story, but again, if Tom Void wants to uh, reveal anything, I mean, not only can he send it to me at Black Box on my radio, but he has his um, YouTube channel, and he probably would get a bigger reception on that one. But Amanda has a comment on Drew Beeson's channel when she says, why is there always fighting between people regarding the Zodiac? Aren't we all trying to get the same answers about who the Zodiac was? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the reason why people follow the Zodiac Killer cases because they want answers to solving a murder mystery from 50 years ago. They want to find out what happened, and I genuinely believe that as true crime followers, there's this natural curiosity that people have. What did it actually go down? What actually happened? And yes, there are elements of human empathy, like people feel things for the victims and the families of the victims. Yes, there is some morbid curiosity, and I, I don't only think that it's a fascination with morbidity. There's also this sense of fearlessness that people in the true crime world have. We are not afraid to look at things that other people might find horrific. We're not afraid to learn about stories that might shock somebody in the general public. Why? Why not? Because they're real because it's true. And if we're going to learn about human behavior and history and science and just how people think and operate, we need to learn about everything, not only the warm, fuzzy, and cozy parts, but um, some of the things that other people might not find super savory. And um, that's my honest answer. Why, why is there fighting in the Zodiac world? Well, maybe I can give you a little bit more clarity. As I said in the beginning, uh, Tom Void is critical of Drew Beeson because he said that he posted resources online for free, such as his interview that he conducted with Don Chaney, as well as posting one of the letters that Don Chaney had um, sent to him, which talks about um, Arthur Lee Allen and a syringe. And um, he actually misspells the word victim in it. I think I think he spelled it V-I-C-T-O-M in that particular letter. And then what Tom Voigt said was that he posted resources on the internet for free, and then Drew Beeson used them as part of his book, Citing It on the Zodiac Killer. Not used them directly, but he heavily referenced them. And again, those are just comments that Tom Voigt has left in other places on the internet. So he felt that there was something disingenuous about writing a for-profit book based on materials that have been shared online for free. Again, just trying to interpret his side of the story. But there was another comment that was left on Drew Beeson's YouTube channel, and it was actually from Steve Allen, who said that there are lots of classy Zodiac researchers out there, such as Michael Butterfield, Mike Morford, Drew Beeson, Michael Cole, and of course, Ned Dahan. Hey, Steve, thank you so much. And there was a reply from Professor Thomas Henry Horan, who is the host of the Stones Unturned podcast, as well as the author of The Myth of the Zodiac Killer. And he says that Butterfingers is as bad as Voight, Morph's okay, Michael Cole is just as willfully stupid as Tom, I don't care what any document says, Voight. Now, to uh, switch gears a little bit, and to say some 
praiseworthy things about Michael Cole. He is the author of the Zodiac Revisited Trilogy, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. I've interviewed Michael Cole a couple times. I did an off-air interview with him, and I did a response to that here on this channel. I have at least uh, three episodes that are dedicated to Michael Cole's uh, books, as well as reiterating some of the comments that we had there. I've also interviewed Michael Cole for the Zodiac Killer Channel's Interview with the Experts series. Now, in his books, he doesn't identify a single Zodiac Killer suspect, but what he does is he thinks that the Zodiac is someone who was very methodical and calculating. And I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally, that the Zodiac Killer committed an enormous amount of crimes, and he did so by mapping out angles on just that, a map, and it's done in a very deliberate and calculated way. And I said I was going to be saying some praiseworthy things because I was about to close the door on Michael Cole. I mean, for a long time, I put him in the category of, okay, I appreciate what he does. I think that he has um, put in a lot of genuine heart and soul into his writings. He seems like an honest guy. I just disagree with his observations, and I notice countless times that people say this in the comments section on any YouTube channel or even on Facebook or some type of discussion group, they say that, oh, they appreciate um, his perspective on the subject, even though they disagree with the observations that he made. And to elaborate, he believes that the Domingo Edwards murders in 63 were the Zodiac, the Swindle murders in 64, the Bates murder in 66, the uh, five Zodiac murders in 68 to 69, as well as the attempted abduction of Kathleen Johns, the murder of Richard Redditch, and the disappearance of Donna Lass, were all committed by a single serial killer, who was someone who was more or less the sad, lonely man theory, maybe a guy who never even got married, someone who was fueled by heterosexual animosity and driven to kill. And the reason, though, that, that, that really didn't affect my thinking. The reason why I said I was about to close the door was, when I talked to Michael Cole about his assessment of the murder of Paul Stein, which occurred on October 11th of 1969, he said that he thought that Paul Stein was killed because he was a taxi driver, and he was driven to a specific location, and that would have lined up with the Zodiac's desire to have angles and mapping as an important component in his criminal behavior. This is much like what I said about um, uh, D Drew Beeson's Don Chaney theory, a criminal masterpiece loaded with mathematical signatures, and... Michael Cole was not the first person to make that observation, and he fully admits it. I mean, you could even perhaps find the clip on YouTube when Gareth Penn is talking about how that's exactly why he thought Michael Cole, sorry, not Michael Cole, the Zodiac Killer drove Paul Stein to the place where he was murdered because he was a taxi driver, and as a taxi driver, he could be driven to a specific location so it would line up with angles on a map. Now, Gareth Penn was the author of Time 17 in 1987. Michael Cole's writings came out much later, and I was just thinking, all right, I see what happened. Michael Cole is an engineer by trade, and he looked at Gareth Penn's theory about angles and radians, and he expanded upon it. That's all it is. I was like, that, that's it. I'm done with this guy. I mean, it's just case closed. That's what happened, and I can't really say anything else other than that. But, but, when I was doing my episodes on the Z32 cipher, I noticed that Michael Cole was talking um, a lot about how the Zodiac could have possibly been ex-Navy or ex-Air Force, and possibly was very knowledgeable about celestial navigation. And when I was trying to learn about the Zodiac Killer Z32 cipher, which was mailed in 1970, I just wanted to look at a digital version of a compass completely unrelated to the Zodiac Killer. And I just wanted to, to see if I could play around with a digital compass and look at some angles on the map and see how this would play out. And the sources that I found talking about compasses frequently used the word radians, the way the Zodiac Killer did. They also frequently talked about um, not only navigation, but also the book, The American Practical Navigator. And I learned about that book from Michael Cole. And they talked about how that was a very inspirational thing on 
navigation that for the late 1800s and the early 1900s, and even all the way to the mid-1900s when the Zodiac is operating, and so many unrelated sources are putting Michael Cole's theory back into play about how the Zodiac could have been ex-Navy or ex-Air Force, the Zodiac could have had a high understanding of angles, the Zodiac could have had celestial navigation knowledge, the Zodiac could have read the book The American Practical Navigator, and as I said, to say something praiseworthy, it turns out that his observations about the Zodiac Killer case may have a lot more value than I gave them credit for. So excuse me for that long, twisted, rambling response about, um, about saying something praiseworthy. The other people that are mentioned here on this list are Michael Butterfingers. Never heard of him before, but I'm going to take a wild guess and say that's Michael Butterfield, the webmaster of ZodiacKillerFacts.com. I've interviewed Michael on the um, Zodiac Killer Channel's Interview with the Experts series, and he was completely polite and fair with me. But, you know, he did say some things about the Zodiac Killer case, as well as certain other researchers. And I don't even know if I should tell you guys this, but I will anyway. Okay, so he gives me his side of the story, and whenever I talk to somebody else about, oh yeah, well, when I interviewed Michael Butterfield, this is what he said... The response I get is, what? No, that's impossible for this particular reason. And people are just very surprised that I'm relaying the comments that I heard from him in that particular way. So I just simply don't know what to think. I got a he said, he said situation going on. and um, But I've only talked to Michael Butterfield one time. As I said, I didn't have a bad experience with him. He came on the show and he wanted to talk about his Zodiac Killer observations, so um, I'm kind of undecided. As far as Mike Morford goes, um, no, I've interacted with Morph a lot, especially corresponding. We definitely disagree about certain things regarding the Zodiac Killer, but Michael Morford has made a lot of very good observations about the disappearance of Donna Lass, and he's also interviewed Donna Lass's former roommate, Joanne Getschy. Donna Lass was, um, according to Michael Cole, the final victim of the Zodiac Killer. I personally don't believe she was murdered by the Zodiac, and um, again, I would just direct you to go over to Michael Morford's podcast, Zodiac Speaking, which he co-hosts with Richard Grinnell, and there is an interview with Joanne Getschy, the former roommate of Donna Lass, who shares a lot of info going into um, her life story, and um, Donna's life story, that is, as well as talking about the possibilities that Donna knew her attacker, knew her abductor, and the abductor knew her as well. And um, you can always uh, find Mike Morford stuff online, such as ZodiacKiller.net, his website, and he is the author as well of the Criminology Podcast Presents the Zodiac Killer. I believe it's the case of the Zodiac Killer. You can get that on Kindle, or you can perhaps find the episodes, but that one is co-authored and co-hosted with Michael Ferguson. A lot of people who uh, research the Zodiac Killer case are named Michael for some reason, and Launchpad 1 listeners will get a break, but YouTube listeners can keep on listening normally. And before moving on, I would just like to say one final thing about this dispute involving Tom Void and Drew Beeson, and that is that... I want to take a very clear stance that there appear to be two major pieces of info that are missing from Tom Voigt's criticisms. The first one is some type of documentation or certifiable proof that Don Cheney's DNA was tested and came back negative, and or even that they have the Zodiac Killer's DNA at all, because as somebody in the general public, I feel like I'm absolutely in the dark. Because, obviously, they're saying that they've eliminated su suspects such as Arthur Lee Allen and Shul Cavale because of DNA. But then when you hear the counter-arguments and people who are challenging that narrative, they're saying something to the exact opposite side. That there's no possible way they could have obtained the Zodiac Killer's DNA, and that they are either mistaken or some people intentionally misrepresented their findings because they wanted to save face and... Some guy who's just like me, who's just hearing things on two sides of the issue, is just thinking, well, what what do I do? Who do I believe in this particular one? So that one, I think, is lost in ambiguity. And as I said before, that if Tom Voigt has numerous samples of Don Cheney's handwriting, I mean, why not reveal them? And then people can make their own determinations if 
they think Don Cheney's handwriting matches the Zodiac Killers or not. But um, I'm I'm really even not so too sure about what law enforcement said about Don Cheney's um, handwriting, but I think that's where I have to leave it at for now. And at this time, I would like to get to your shout-outs for the supporters on buymeacoffee.com. As I said, anyone who makes a contribution to the show will get a shout-out. The first one is to Sobek Lord, who says, Enjoy the coffee, Ned. Sobek, L-O-T-F-C. And um, I'm not sure what that means. Does that mean love of the freaking content, maybe? But hey, thank you, Sobek Lord. And the next one comes to us from... Jamie Hill, who says, Dude, you rock. Where's Steve? And I wasn't quite sure if you're refer referring to one of the regular listeners to the program, Steve Allen, or to Stephen Avery, because I would started a multi-part series on the uh, case of Stephen Avery, who is the subject of the Netflix docuseries Making a Murderer, which is um, about Stephen Avery, his nephew Brendan Dassey, and the 2005 murder of Teresa Hallback. I hope to continue some of that this summer, and definitely... Um, uh, just see where the story takes us, because recently Stephen Avery was transferred to a minimum security prison, and a statement was released by his attorney, Kathleen Zellner, saying that, okay, that's the first step. Now the next step is trying to get him out, because they believe that Stephen Avery was wrongfully convicted for the 2005 murder of Teresa Hallback. But the difference between a story like Making a Murderer and the Zodiac Killer is we might actually see some results in the very near future. On the one hand, there are some people who think that the Zodiac Killer mystery is going to be solved relatively soon. I'm not 100% certain that that's going to happen. And then there are other people out there, even Drew Beeson, um, who, who I've been discussing, said that the case will most likely never be solved to everybody's satisfaction. But, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I mean, it's it's still up in the air, but... Part of me is just hoping that some way, somehow, we're going to have a Golden State Killer ending when there's going to be some type of forensic breakthrough, and we're all just going to find out, okay, this person was the Zodiac Killer, or even if it's a group of people, or even if it's orchestrated in some particular way, we will have some type of universal understanding of what happened, and the victims and their families will get closure, they can finally rest in peace, and also it would just put an end to all of the wild theories out there, but we will uh, keep going. And um, I think that that person, though, might have actually been referring to Steve Allen, because the next um, supporter on buymeacoffee.com is indeed Steve Allen, who says, also known as Ned's number one fan, keep kicking ass, Ned. Steve, thank you so much. And we have one from Floyd Black 53 who says, these shows get me pondering into the wee hours. Love the Zodiac shows best. Go buy some books, Ned. You will have a lot of reading to do. Oh, yes, I got a big summer reading list, too. And um, I have uh, two novels in the Invasion America series that I'm going to be trying to read for fun. And they're actual paperback books, not to the um, Kindle version. And I I really don't read too many novels in paperback form. But um, as far as the true crime books that I'll be discussing with you guys, yeah, I'm going through um, some more Zodiac Killer ones, as well as um, talking about some of these other theories out there. Like I mentioned, um, the one about geometric shapes and patterns and Zodiac star signs. I'm going to be going through that book. It's by Wolfgang Schindler. And um, also, I picked up a copy of Lunches with Mr. Q, which is written by Kevin Nelson. And I need to apologize to Kevin because I was talking about that book last week, but I didn't show the graphic until the very end. Yes, he is somebody who wrote this book about Shel Cavale, Mike Rodelli's Zodiac Killer suspect. And again, this book isn't designed to be a Zodiac Killer one, but it's written all about someone who has been accused of these crimes, and I'm always going to be curious what other people have to say. And uh, Shel Cavale actually authored his own book called I Never Look Back, and I think that that just ties right into his... Um, speed junkie, adrenaline junkie, need for speed addiction that he had. Shel Cavale just seemed absolutely obsessed with auto racing, horse racing, and um, even even running himself unofficially tied the world record for the 100 meter dash, which was actually set by Jesse Owens at the time. So yes, lots of reading to do this um, summer. And right now I would like to move on to something that is a little bit more fitting of the title, Zodiac Killer News Report. And I had so many things to talk to you guys about today before I saw um, these videos from Tom and Drew, but they, I would just, um, to get to it right now, 
Travis Miller runs the Lawrence Kane WordPress, Lawrence Kane Word, uh, dot WordPress dot com, and he's been researching the life of Lawrence Kane, a Zodiac killer suspect, for more than ten years. And recently, he sent me an email in regards to something that I had said on my episode Lawrence Kane debunked. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't heard those or watched those videos yet. I used to do the debunking series, where I would talk about some Zodiac Killer suspects whom I think absolutely were not the Zodiac Killer, and Lawrence Kane was one of them. I used to think that he was somewhat high on the list, like maybe a 7 out of 10, but then I just had to keep lowering him and lowering him and lowering him, because number one, it's possible that he might have been on the shorter side, like even too short to match some of these 5 foot 8 descriptions. It seems like his height is around 5 foot 7, and I mostly only entertain suspects who are 5 foot 8 to 6 feet tall, but in one of his mug shots he does appear that he is um around maybe 5 foot 8, so just borderline in that respect. And the second one is that um, I think that his facial features are absolutely inconsistent with that of the Zodiac Killer uh, composite sketch. But there was the thing that I said in the debunking series was that Lawrence Kane at one time worked for a mobster named Alan Dorfman in organized crime. And I said that I thought that this was absolutely contrary to anything Zodiac-related. Working for a mobster, anything involving organized crime syndicates, and that includes Arthur Lee Allen, because he, um, I guess, tried to at one point. But any of these suspects, even Troy Houghton would be another one who did some other things with a very organized group. I just didn't think that, that has, there's an ounce of evidence in any of the Zodiac material to suggest that. So I received this message from Travis Miller, firstly in the comment section on the Zodiac Killer debunking series, but then he sent me an email, and anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com, saying, Regarding Alan Dorfman, I suspect that Lawrence Kane was actually working for a Las Vegas, Lake Tahoe-based real estate developer named Al Dorfman. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, there's a high chance that that could be the same, right? Well, someone who thought that was Harvey Hines, the person who wrote a very detailed report on Lawrence Kane, someone who thought that Lawrence Kane was the Zodiac Killer. I'm sure you've seen the video of him on YouTube where he reveals his solution to the Z13 cipher, which is named Kane 1924. And Travis continues by saying, I suggest that Harvey Hines, when assembling his report in the 1990s, conflated Alan Dorfman with the real estate developer Albert Dorfman, who went by the name Al, due to their overlapping whereabouts together with the rarity of the name. And that means that this entire thing about Lawrence Kane having an organized crime connection could simply have just been a giant mistake. To continue, Albert Dorfman, also known as Al, was stated in the Harvey Hines report as working at the Sahara Tahoe and Lawrence Kane worked at the Sahara Tahoe as a sales representative and public relations officer for a land develop company, land development company named Wellington Orient Incorporated. Wellington Orient, in turn, had a subsidiary called Miami Beach Vacations. One of the partners in the Miami Beach firm was the aforementioned Albert Dorfman. According to Albert Dorfman's obituary, he first came to Las Vegas in 1954 from Billings, Montana, as a minority partner with Milton Prell and Al Winters in the Club Bingo, which later became the Sahara Tahoe Hotel, after it was purchased by Del Webb. He moved permanently to Las Vegas in 1968. He was in the public relations and real estate sector, a partner in Miami Beach vacations with offices in the Sahara Thunderbird, Oh, sorry, the Sahara, comma, the Thunderbird, the Mint and the Dunes, as well as offices in Reno and Lake Tahoe. Dorfman's obituary also notes that he was an associate of William Bennett, who managed the Sahara Tahoe, and actor Buddy Hackett, who was vice president of the Sahara Nevada Corporation. And Travis Miller and I exchanged several different messages, but I wanted to get a very clear point and understanding of this. Is he saying that this whole thing about Lawrence Kane working for the mobster Alan Dorfman 
is just a giant mistake on the part of Harvey Hines, and the whole time he w was actually working for perhaps a more honest real estate developer named Albert Dorfman, not Alan Dorfman, and Travis Miller responded by saying, yes, you understood correctly. However, he wouldn't call Albert Dorfman a honest businessman. And I was like, okay, I don't know too much about that guy. I'll take your word for it. I would expect that there must be some type of shady dealings going on. But does this change my stance on Lawrence Kane as a Zodiac Killer suspect? Does that mean that he does not belong in the Zodiac Killer debunking series? No. Absolutely not. I mean, I can accept that that is um, an incorrect piece of ma information that was widely distributed throughout the internet, but the reason why it doesn't change my stance on him is because, if anything, that speaks to the credibility of Harvey Hines, who assembled this report in the first place, which just shows that perhaps he didn't have the most thorough understanding of the people in the life of Lawrence Kane. And furthermore, it also just goes to show that Harvey Hines gets accused of this stuff all the time. Ever since I did those first episodes on Lawrence Kane, I began to um, just hear this from other people, that they're telling these stories about how Harvey Hines was just either not what I liked, people didn't trust him, and I, d I have no idea what his true intention and motivation was going on there. I do admit that it really is um, quite shocking that Lawrence Kane even has a connection at all to the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino, because you guys will remember that that is the place where Donna Lass was working, a possible Zodiac Killer victim, and she disappeared from the Sahara Tahoe at possibly 1.46 in the morning. I'd, I'm not really sure. On September 6th of 1970, what happened to her is a mystery. Was she abducted by the Zodiac Killer, or was she simply just abducted and murdered by someone who was in her personal life? And I tend to think it's the latter, because I'm really just not convinced that there's an ounce of a Zodiac connection. I'm, I'm just not seeing it. And also, I do not believe that the 1970 abduction of Kathleen Johns was the Zodiac Killer either, because those crimes are so different than that of the Zodiac in 1968 and 69. And I know that this person is writing letters saying that he's going to disguise his crimes to make them look like ordinary um, robberies or just the activities of criminal thugs. Paraphrasing, paraphrasing, those aren't quotations. But I just don't see how that shows anything like abducting someone off of Highway Route 132 in California. That was on um, March 22nd of 1970, the abduction of Kathleen Johns, driving around with her, setting her car on fire, and then the abduction of Donna Lass in 1970. The Zodiac was so weak. Just someone who would only go after the victims when they were either defenseless were completely incapacitated or just restrained and bound like at Lake Berryessa, and I do not think that that point needs enough reiteration. We just need to hear that over and over again. The Lake Herman Road murders occurred on December 20th of 1968 with the um, murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. The Zodiac may have ordered them out of their car, but he shot two defenseless teenagers who, who didn't have any way of fighting back. He has a firearm, they did not, and he murdered them in cold blood. The Blue Rock Spring shooting on July 4th of 1969, same story. Shooting two unarmed people sitting in a car and running away. The Lake Berryessa stabbing. The Zodiac didn't attack the victims until they were bound and restrained and had no ability to fight back. The murder of Paul Stein on October 11th of 1969. The Zodiac killer shot a taxi driver in the side of the head, and that's... Um, I mean, how on earth would he um, have really been able to fight back? But because bear in mind that Paul Stein wouldn't have had any idea that this person um, wearing rust-colored pants and some type of parka-like coat was going to murder him. So I think the point that I'm trying to get at is those crimes, such as the attempted abduction of Kathleen Johns and the abduction of Donna Lass, are way too personal, physical, and intimate for the Zodiac Killer. That's why I don't believe the Zodiac had anything to do with them. And most importantly, the victims in those cases would have had way more of an ability to defend themselves than the ones I just talked about. Kathleen Johns, she wasn't restrained at all. No, I don't think so. Donna Lass was 
allegedly abducted from her place of employment, although it could be um, she was abducted after walking home to her um, play, place of residence, the Monteverdi apartment complex on Pioneer Trail Road. But if you go to my playlist on the disappearance of Donna Lass, I used to do a regular series about her. I don't believe that. That is an alternative theory. I strongly suggest that she was abducted from the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino, or maybe she crossed paths with the wonderful Albert Dorfman, not Alan Dorfman. So, um, getting back to Lawrence Kane, though, I think that this just um, shows that maybe he was never really a very strong suspect to begin with. And at this time, though, I would like to uh, s switch gears a little bit and move on to another possible solution to the Zodiac Killer ciphers. And I have to give a shout out to Sphere, also known as Sphere the Cube. And this one was sent in as well to the email address blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. And Sphere has proposed a new solution to the Zodiac Killer's Z18 code. The Zodiac Killer not only committed crimes, but he also wrote letters, made phone calls, and wrote in the ciphers, which he is perhaps most famous for. And the first cipher that the Zodiac sent in was called the 408, because it had 408 characters. And it has been mostly decoded. It's the one that says, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's even more fun than getting your rocks off of the girl. I can do better than that, right? Last thing. I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's even more fun than hunting wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. Um, even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. When I die, I'll be reborn in paradise, and those who I have killed will be my slaves. Something to that effect. But the final line of the 408 cipher has never been completely decoded, and it is referred to as the Z18 code. And Sphere has uh, sent in a possible solution saying that the reason why people were not able to decode it is because it was actually written in Pig Latin. So I don't misrepresent this, I want to give you guys the most Oxford English dictionary style definition of Pig Latin. And it is a language formed from English by transferring the initial consonant or consonant cluster of each word to the end of the word and adding a vocalic syllable, usually a. So pig Latin would become ig pe atin le. So it's not exactly a real language, but more like a system of disguising English language words. How about encoding English language words? And the pig Latin solution to the Z18 code is as follows. And the first the letters are E B E O R I E T E M E T H H P H H I P T I. Okay, butcher that a little bit, but um, I think you can get the idea. There is this set of eighteen letters. Now the first step that you have to do is to rearrange them, and if you um, put them in a particular order, and this can be done very easily, it is. Obitre, ime, ethe, ipte, ihe. And it comes out in a phonetic operation, so you actually would have to um, kind of give the possibility that you would just need to add the A sound onto the end of the words. The AY isn't actually written there, but many people have pointed out that this could contain the name Robert. There's the obitre would be Robert. And the translation of obitre ipe ithe ipte ihe would be the tip. Hi, I'm Robert. And I think that there are two major words that people often look for in the Z18 code. The first one is Robert, and the second one is before. When I first looked at this thing, like for the absolute first time in 2011, I thought that I could see the word before, even though there's no F. And there was that one YouTuber out there who called himself T, and he said that it, the solution was before me, the thy pity. He thought the same thing I did, except before me, the thy pity isn't a very good uh, sentence. But believe it or not, I actually think that this is a reasonable solution to the Z18 cipher, or Z18 code, rather. 
Obatre ime ithe ipte ihe is Pig Latin for the tip, hi, I'm Robert. And after the revelation of the 340 cipher being solved in, uh, that was in the winter of 2020, right? It appeared that the Zodiac most likely has real solutions to all of his ciphers and codes. There was a big debate about this before. Some people were saying this, the 408 cipher was solved so easily. I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's more fun than hunting wild game in the forest. I did it better that time. But the other ciphers, such as the Z340, the Z32, and the Z13, people are saying those are just duds. If they actually had any real meaning, they would have been solved by now. And I, I really thought that was a very high possibility. I tried to solve the Z340 myself, and you can still hear my attempted solution. But I was wrong, and I'll fully admit that. David Orenchak, Earl Van Eyck, and Sam Blake perhaps achieved the real solution, almost certainly achieved the real solution. So uh, the Z18, though, is a little bit different, because this is the final line of text at the bottom of a different piece of um, another cipher. And some people think that this may have just been done by accident. It was a mistake on the part of the cryptographer. And then there are people out there such as Steve Hodell and Gary Stewart. And this is the only time I'll ever say anything praiseworthy about Gary Stewart. They propose that it's meaningless. It's just meant to keep you guessing. Kind of like the dud or the red herring theory. That could be the case. But the whole reason why I'm telling you this is I can only guess. But I think that a serial killer of this um, nature would put his real identity in there. If you crack the code, you'll get my real identity somewhere. Not the 340. That's been solved. Not the 408. That's mostly been solved. But the final line, the Z18, perhaps yes. The Z13 cipher, perhaps. Uh, I don't believe the Zodiac put his identity in the Z32 because he says very clearly that it's not about his identity. It's about the location of a bomb. But what do you think about this solution to the Z18 code? One more time, the letters are E-B-E-O-R-I-E-T-E-M-E-T-H-H-I-P-T-I. -E 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 you can rearrange them to Obatre Ime Ithe Ipte Ihe, which is Pig Latin for the tip, hi, I'm Robert. And even if he gives you his first name, what was his last name? Robert Smith or something like that? How on earth would we be able to find out which Robert? So giving his identity, but nothing that could actually get him convicted. So, I mean, is this the actual solution to the code? I don't know, but I think it's a pretty good attempt on the part of Sphere. So I give Sphere a lot of uh, credit and thank you for sending this in. And I'm always willing to listen to anybody's thoughts and ideas on the cipher, but I did say there people did point out the word Robert, and one person who talked about that very frequently was none other than Robert Graysmith, and um, he didn't think that the solution was Robert Smith, of course, his uh, birth name. No, Graysmith said that it was Robert Emmett the Hippie, and when I was reading the book Zodiac Unmasked, which I have a book discussion about here on this channel, he said that in the 1980s, he met up with the journalist Paul Avery, and they were discussing the ciphers, and they brought up the Z18 code. And Graysmith asks Paul Avery, what do you think that code was? And Avery says, I still think that it's Robert Emmett. Robert Emmett the hippie. And Robert Emmett isn't even a real Zodiac killer suspect, to the best of my knowledge. I have one episode about him. It's mostly tied to a statue of Robert Emmett, the Irish Revolutionary at Golden Gate Park, and I think that that could have been a clue to the killer's identity as opposed to the actual killer's identity. But absolutely, I think the tip, hi, I'm Robert, is a better answer than Robert Emmett the hippie because, I mean, there's really just not a whole lot in the Zodiac Killer's language that suggests that he actually was a hippie. Maybe somebody who hated hippies, but... Why on earth would you call yourself that if your name's Robert Emmett and you're the Zodiac Killer and you hate hippies? Why would you say I'm Robert Emmett the Hippie? So I'm going with this Pig Latin version more. But if you um, want to challenge um, Sphere on this or challenge me on any of the observations I've made, please feel free to do so. And 
Also, if you want to weigh in on anything that Tom Foyt and Drew Beeson have shared about their ideas in regards to the Zodiac Killer mystery, you can put those in the comments section down below, or you want to talk about Michael Cole or Lawrence Kane, the Zodiac Killer suspect, I also want to hear those from you. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 on Instagram. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.